Hey there, it's Dr. Mary Barbera here for day 17 of 30 of my live sessions. And tonight we're going to talk about advanced talking, which is in chapter nine of my brand new book, Turn Autism Around, an action guide for parents of young children with early signs of autism. I'm going to cover the five most common mistakes parents and professionals make and how to avoid them. So if you're here, if you can let me know where you're viewing from, whether you're catching us live or you are catching the replay. And I'm going to go get our other friends here and we are going to get going. Um, and if you have a question about talking, um, a child's talking, but not conversational and any questions about the mistakes I go over, I'll be happy to entertain them. And we are going to get started in just a minute with our content for tonight. Um, for those of you uh, joining us, let us know where you're viewing from. Again, I'm Dr. Mary Barbera. I have been in the autism world for over two decades, first as a confused and overwhelmed parent, and then uh, 20 plus years later as a board certified behavior analyst, registered nurse, with a PhD, best-selling author, online course creator, podcaster, my Turn Autism Around podcast. Um, let me know in the comments where you are viewing from. This is day 17 of 30 in preparation for my book coming out on March 30th. I decided to do live uh, sessions every day, turning into every evening Eastern time. Um, and, uh, I'd love to know where you're viewing from, or if you're catching the replay, let me know that too. Yeah. Australia is in the house. I tend to get a lot of Australians, especially when I do later in the day. So welcome. I've been to Australia three times, um, all to present on autism. I've actually traveled around the world quite a bit speaking on autism. I wrote two books. I wrote a book in 2007. Well, it was published in 2007. It's called The Verbal Behavior Approach, How to Teach Children with Autism and Related Disorders. It's in over a dozen languages. Like I said, I traveled around the world speaking um, based on this book. And now, many years later, my new book is going to teach parents my four-step proven um, method for helping parents increase talking, decrease tantrums, and help children sleep better, eat better, potty train more easily, go to the doctor's dentist and get haircuts without a fuss. Tonight we are talking all about chapter nine, which is called Talking But Not Conversational Strategies to Expand Language. And we are gonna specifically talk about the five most common mistakes I've seen in my 20 years with um, kids that I would consider intermediate learners. Now, if you have not um, pre-ordered my book yet, it is definitely time, past time, but definitely not too late to pre-order my book now at turnautismaround.com. And um, there is just a few more days left to join our book launch team, which has over 625 very motivated parents and professionals, grandparents in there. And I am actually broadcasting this live directly into that group too. So if you are on the book launch team and you're seeing this within the book launch team group, uh, leave me a comment or give me a thumbs up too. This is a really um, important chapter of my book. Um, I've been doing lives each night and so I wanted to make sure I cover all the chapters and I think I have. So if you have missed all my lives, um, you can go back after I'm done and go to marybarbera.com forward slash Facebook or forward slash YouTube to catch all my previous lives. They're about 15, 20, 30 minutes long. And I will take um, questions, especially related to either the book I'd love to know if you've already pre-ordered, if you're in the book launch team, let me know that in the comments. And I'll also take questions about what I'm covering tonight. Okay. So let me just see who's here. Uh, Lula, she, this is like 
you've been here every day, I think. Uh, Lily Daisy has been here 17 days in a row. Excellent. She's from Australia. West Philadelphia, Sharon, I um, am in Why I'm Missing, Pennsylvania, and I lived in Philadelphia for a number of years after I graduated with my bachelor's from Westchester University, and I worked at University of Penn, where I got my master's degree and lived in, I actually lived in West Philly near Penn for a few years, and so have a special place in my heart for Philadelphia. We have somebody from UK, North Carolina, a few people from Australia, Tennessee, um, excellent, Cincinnati, and Malaysia, Vancouver, Kentucky, Oregon, Canada, Italy, Bronx, um, Massachusetts, awesome. So we have uh, quite a few people from all different parts of the world. And let me know here if you are already on my book launch team, I would love it. Um, if you join my book launch team by pre-ordering and, and joining our Facebook group, you're actually going to be able to read the first three chapters right away, get your reviews ready for Amazon because the book is coming out in less than two weeks, which is really exciting. Okay. Now I'm not going to read you the whole chapter, obviously, but as I was writing chapter nine, it was, it was kind of a tough one. And I went over to a little boy's house. So in chapter three, um, is all about safety. And I bring up a little boy, um, and I use the name Sam and Sam at the time he was young and his parents, I worked with Sam and like from the time he was 20, 21 months of age. Um, when Sam was about five, I think, um, single, uh, the only child, two parents, they brought him to um, visit the Statue of Liberty with another couple or family. So, um, and his name is not Sam, but um, Sam got lost. Um, his father was going through the security and his belt made security go off. So anyway, um, you know, by the time all that rigmarole went through, um, Sam was lost. And so they didn't know if he went out to the street, if he w ran and went on the ferry. Um, they were really panicked. Um, so they ended up finding Sam like five minutes, 10 minutes later, um, out on the curb. Uh, sidewalk area. So he was safe, but it was really scary. So took the parents a long time to decide to have another child and they have another child. So his name, not his real name either, but we're going to call him Drew. And so he starts off chapter nine and here's what happened. Cause I was writing my book during COVID. I had the contract and I started writing January of 2020. And so it was the spring, maybe May or early June of 2020. And Sam's mom contacted me and she is a physician. And she said that she was really in a panic because Drew was turning three that week. And all of a sudden, you know, he wasn't potty trained. He was stopped going to daycare every day because of COVID, because it was closed or very limited. Um, dad was working from home, mom's a physician, so she was working in the hospital. Um, and Drew just all of a sudden looked like he might have autism. And she asked me to come over and take a look at him. So I went over and I brought my stat bag, which is the screening tool for autism and toddlers. And, um, and I start off the chapter talking about that visit. Now I don't in my book talk about COVID because like my first book, I want this book to be good for decades and not specific to like, hopefully in 50 years, nobody will realize what COVID is. We can only pray. But Drew, um, you know, she said he likes his car, he likes cars, he likes, you know, um, he's talking, not conversational yet, was just turning three. Um, so I went with my stat bag and in the first 
um, test. There's like 12 different little subtests. And the first test involved a car rolling a car back and forth. And he was passing these things, but um, passing, rolling the car back. But his problem was, Drew's problem was, when I went to put the car away, he totally wanted the car. and was grabbing and screaming and um, just had a horrible time transitioning from one activity to another. And to the point where he was just like really melting down and the parents are like, boy, we never see this, but they were inadvertently reinforcing his tantrums. So he, when he was screaming, yellow car, yellow car, they were right away saying that's Miss Mary's yellow car. We'll buy you a car at the store tomorrow. And anytime a child is screaming and people are talking, trying to soothe the child, that's just adding fuel to the fire. Um, and so I just saw a lot of things going on and in the end reassured the parents that it was probably um, a COVID situation where he was really out of touch socially, imitation, following classroom rules, sharing, interacting with typical kids, um, and that the plan was for him to start restart preschool that following week, turn three. He was doing okay with potty training and just gave him some advice about not reinforcing any crying, any screaming, any grabbing and that sort of thing. So anyway, that's the big story in chapter nine, but, um, we talk about what conversation is and, you know, a lot of the, my previous lives, a lot of this book is for kids who aren't talking or just saying one or two, two word utterances here and there. But there is also a whole lot of kids, a whole lot of toddlers and preschoolers who might have early signs of autism, ADHD, sensory processing issues, and they are talking. They, they might be conversational or just about conversational, but they're still delayed and they're still having, like Drew could talk in full sentences. He was saying things like, um, I had this one activity where um, I was, had a spinny thing and it went around, you know, and then he'd go and find it and give it back to me. And he said, you know, make it go up to the roof. So he called the ceiling, the roof, but like, that's fine. That's a whole sentence. But when he would have a fit, he would, my, me, me, yellow car, you know? So his tantrums made his language much worse. Um, in the end, um, he did straighten out. They, they put him on a list to get him tested for a speech delay because that's really where if a child is talking that much and conversational or almost conversational, you really need to get standardized speech and language testing because I don't know where they exactly should be and they're, they're going to need more testing. But the problem was and is, is that the wait lists for these things are horrendous. So let's go over the five mistakes, um, in this chapter. And I have to actually look at them because I do not know. Okay. Mistake number one is focusing on the length of phrases and sentences. Um, so setting goals, like the child will talk in four or five word length sentences. Um, that's a goal for a lot of people. And what that does is it, uh, forces people to, to add carrier phrases like I want, I see, that's a, uh, and it, that usually almost always backfires. I did a video blog on carrier phrases. So after this, you could Google Mary autism carrier phrases to hear more about that. I tell some stories about how that's backfired. Um, but the other thing, when you're talking about a four word sentence or something like that, um, I learned from Barb Ash, who's a speech and language pathologist and a behavior analyst to get combined. She really focuses on syllable length. So a child might have one syllable, one syllable length utterances like pop or car or high, by, eyes, ears, nose, mouth. Those are all one syllable. Then you go with two syllables like cracker, cookie, bye-bye, those sorts of things. Um, and then 
you go to three syllables, four syllables. So I, the cat ran down the street is, or the cat is brown, you know, whatever. You can have, you know, five words, five syllables. The cat is dark brown. You know, five words, five syllables. Or you can have one word like refrigerator, which is one word but five syllables. And so Barbesh really taught me, um, you know, a decade ago or so, is to really focus on syllable length, not word length. And so focusing on building sentences is really um, usually backfires. Okay, and I tell you exactly step by step what you should do instead, but obviously this is only a 20 minute live, so we're gonna go quickly. Uh, mistake number two is not knowing how to deal with scripting. Scripting is delayed echolalia, scripting for movies. Um, kids that talk um, tend to script, and then people think, like, well, that's a part of autism, that's what he does for, you know, to calm himself down, or they try to engage in that script and it's just um scripting isn't bad it's stimming we all stim when we don't have uh, what as leisure activities but when you're trying to teach a child a skill and they're scripting then it's getting in the way so i go into how to um help children talk more functionally Okay, mistake number three is not knowing how to prevent or correct language errors. So if I had a dime for every intermediate learner where you hold up a toothbrush and they say, you say, what is it? And they say, brushing your teeth. And people are like, well, you do brush your teeth. That's good. And they never said toothbrush or they have errors like they call marker a crayon or they call paper towels, napkins. We call these conditional discrimination errors. There's a way to prevent that, a way to fix that, a way to teach, um, but many people don't know that. Mistake number four is hyper-focusing on colors or other pre-academic skills. Um, a lot of kids, actually one of the signs of autism um, might be hyperlexia, which is an extreme interest in letters and reading before you can fully speak. Um, so people tend to, I had this one client that I say in the book is, you know, he was over at my house. I was helping to assess him and I said, what's this? And I pointed to a chair that happened to be the color yellow. And he said, yellow chair. And the parents were all proud. Not only did he say chair, he said yellow chair, but that's actually not good because now if we say yellow chair, and now we're going to try to teach him sit in a chair and this is the back of the chair. These are the legs of the chair, um, those types of things. And he's hyper-focused on yellow, yellow chair. And so it's not a huge deal, but it is something that I see a lot as an error. And number five mistake is focusing too much on talking while neglecting other areas. So we also have to think about receptive language, following direction, imitation, matching, um, and self-care skills. Washing your hands, potty training, sleeping in your bed through the night, um, soothing yourself, uh, keeping yourself entertained with appropriate leisure activities. These are all skills that are usually delayed in kids with autism. And so there's a hyper focus on um, language. So in my book, I have two chapters on talking, one on reducing tantrums, uh, one chapter on is it speech delay, autism, ADHD. Um, we have chapters on eating, sleeping, potty training, going to the doctor's dentist haircut without a fuss. I've talked about all of these in previous Facebook lives. So if you find that you, you might be making some of these mistakes or your child doesn't have enough language that you're making these mistakes much, um, yet you're still going to want to pre-order the book. It's very detailed, very step-by-step. -step. And, um, I, it is the book I wish I had two decades ago when my husband first mentioned the possibility that my son had autism. Um, it's a guide. It's, 
um, very child friendly and I know it's going to help a lot of people. So I'll take any last questions about the book or about advanced talking. Um, Simple says she's ordering today. Excellent. Um, will your book be available in Europe? Yes. If you go to turnautismaround.com, there is an international order button. You can also Google Amazon or you can just Google, say you're in Italy, you can search turn autism around book Italy or Florence, Italy, and you can see what pops up. So it should be at bookstores. It should be on Amazon if you have it in your country. And if not, we sell it internationally through a third party. Um, I don't sell any of the books. Everything is distributed um, and sold through my publisher. And in terms of translation rights, I heard that Korean and Chinese are both um, signed. But those, even those translations that are now signed t will take 18 months to two years till it comes out in that language. There will be an audio, audio book. It's audible. I read the book. It's very good. And you can order that on Amazon. Um, New Jersey is here. Um, excellent. Texas, California, Canada. Let me see if we have any questions over here. Um, what is scripting? Excellent. Actually, that's a really good question. So, um, I just did a video blog a couple weeks ago, so you can search Mary autism. What is stimming? Cause stimming and scripting are very similar. So, um, if children are responding, learning new words, um, learning new skills like hand washing and toothbrushing and all those kind of skills, that means that the demands are correct and the reinforcement is correct. They are in essence pushing the middle button. I did a, some blogs on the three button theory. Um, so they're pushing the middle button. Everything's going fine. If they're not pushing the middle button though, they are, if the task is too hard, the reinforcement's too low, then they are either pushing one of these two side buttons. One is escape where they want to leave the table. They're throwing themselves on the ground. They're swiping materials. They're throwing themselves on the ground when it's time for bath. It doesn't have to be table time or academic work. So they're having or refusal. If they have language, they might refuse, yell, argue. But the other button on the other side is they could have kind of self-stimulatory behavior. They're basically making their own fun. Um, so if you think about, like if you are in a lecture and you don't understand what they're saying, say it's in a different language, you're gonna sit there and you're gonna have to do something. So if you can, you can get out your phone, you could throw through Facebook, you could doodle. So kids with autism or signs of autism might not know how to doodle. They don't know how to scroll through Facebook. And so they might have self-stimulatory behavior, which might be some of the lower level stims are like rocking. Some kids can bang their head. Some kids can, um, anything, chew on their cuticles, bite their nails. Um, they could also, if they're in a room with toys, they could line things up. They could, um, repetitively play with things over and over again. If they can have screens, they can watch the same videos or credits over and over again. But if they have language and they do have a lot of screen time, they tend to want to watch the same movies over and over again, and they can develop uh, delayed echolalia or, or scripting, which is a form of stimming. And, uh, so I give the example in my book and some of my video blogs, like we, before we knew Lucas had autism, we would take him to the museum and there'd be a sign there, actually several signs, six feet apart, 10 feet apart that said, please do not feed the ducks. So he'd run to this sign and my husband would say, please do not feed the ducks, quack, quack. And then he'd run to the next sign. And then my husband would go, please do not feed the ducks, quack, quack. Lucas didn't say anything there when we were at the museum, but in the middle of the night, he might wake up 
and say, please do not feed the ducks, quack, quack. That's a delayed echolalia or a script. Some kids script constantly. If you've ever seen the movie Rain Man, that man was scripting. The character played by Dustin Hoffman was scripting. Um, like I said, scripting and stimming isn't bad. It, if I see a child scripting, that means at least they have language. They can memorize. They can articulate. It's not bad. We just need to figure out a way to teach them new skills and teach them to fun functionally communicate as much as possible. Okay, so that is what scripting is. Uh, Janet's from Ohio. She can't wait to get my book. Um, my son is using unusual words in a conversation that interests him. In other conversations, he struggles to express himself. Yeah, so this, this chapter in the whole book would be really good for you to read. Um, I do have an online course too for parents and professionals called the Verbal Behavior Bundle. So I have two courses. I have a toddler preschooler course, which is great for kids up to age five. And then I have the Verbal Behavior Bundle, which includes an intermediate learner course where we talk all about these kids that are talking, but not conversational. And um, yeah, I have a lot of experience with that. What is your opinion on teaching a second language to a child? My first language is Spanish and it would be nice to teach that to my son. Not sure if that's confusing. Um, it's, um, it's a controversial issue actually. Most of the research in the bilingual trilingual field says that kids can handle a bunch of different languages. But in my experience, I tend to want to get the first 10 or 100 words, single words in one language, and that would be the language where the child would go to preschool, his early intervention professionals would speak that language. Um, and then um, we introduce a second language once we can get the initial words going. So it's a personal decision. I do have a video blog and a podcast, so you can search Mary Autism Bilingual if you want after this. My son is three and his name is Lucas. Excellent. I still love the name Lucas. So that's awesome. Okay. So it looks like those are the big questions. Um, my son is 25 months old. He learns a word, uses it for a few days, but then he stops. Also, he understands a lot of words, but doesn't repeat or try to say them. Yeah. So we call that echoic control. That's also covered heavily in the book. And, um, so I call those pop out words when you have words, but you don't hear them all the time. And the key is, is that you develop, learn the strategies in the book and develop what's called echoic control, where I say something, you say something. Uh, I say ball, you say ball. I say, I love you. You say, I love you. But that doesn't happen overnight. And that doesn't happen unless you really have good systematic procedures that are child-friendly, positive, no cry approach. And that's all in my book. So um, I would definitely pre-order the book and I would consider joining my online course as well because the book is going to be a lot, but the online course is proven to work for many, many parents and professionals around the world. Um, here's a question not related. Okay. Here's a question related. My daughter is 4.5 ASD and just starting to talk in sentences. Would you recommend this book for her? Yes. Because talking in sentences really needs to be flexible. And if people are teaching her to rotely talk in sentences, it's probably going to backfire. So you definitely want to grab the book. Um, and there's a question about potty training. I'm not going to answer that. We did do a, a Facebook live the other day on potty training. Also, I have a free potty guide. There's a chapter of my book on potty. So, um, if you uh, can't wait 13 days for the book, you can search Mary Autism Potty for more information, but I would really encourage everybody here, go get the book, join our launch team, and let's start spreading the word that we can empower parents to detect and treat the earliest signs of autism. And we can help each child reach his or her fullest potential, be as safe as possible, as independent as possible, and as happy as possible. That's it for today. I'll be back tomorrow for another 
a live session. In the meantime, hope to see you on the launch team. Bye.